Hi everyone, welcome back to Property Couple. My name's Leah and today I thought we'd just chat about some estate agent jargon that they seem to use. If you're buying property, if you're selling property, it's just worth knowing some of this lingo that is used because some of it might just go straight over your head and I just think it's worth going through them all. So let's just kick it off. Firstly, buyer. A buyer is you if you're the person buying property. A seller is also you if you're the one selling the property. It's just the person who's selling their house or a house. The vendor is just another word for the seller. So often the vendor is what the estate agent will refer to as the seller. Just because I, I don't think, I think they just use that word because they just like it a bit more. I'm not too sure. They'll just say, oh, I just spoke to the vendor. It just means they've spoken to the owner, the seller. A first time buyer is somebody who has never owned or purchased property before. So this is the first time they're buying. They don't own any property abroad. They haven't inherited any property. If you've inherited perhaps some property in somebody's will, then in some cases you're not a first time buyer but it's always worth checking with your solicitor. Things could be different to do with like beneficial ownership or just like legal ownership. So it's just worth checking. I'm not speaking from any professional advice. This is just from my findings. Everything of what I'm saying can be found online. So yeah, definitely check if you're like, am I a first time buyer or am I not? And renting a property doesn't count as buying or owning. So if you're someone who's renting and you haven't got any property, you probably are a first time buyer. So don't be confused by that. You might hear this term freehold or leasehold. A freehold is a type of occupancy, which means that you own the building and the land that it sits on. For example, right now I'm in a flat. If I had bought this flat, I would only own the leasehold of this flat because the building and the foundations and the land it sits on is owned by the freeholder and the people inside it are often leaseholders. It's like a type of ownership. It means that you have the right to rent that property and live inside it and occupy that property for a certain amount of time. Sometimes with leaseholds, you'll see like up to 99 years or 125 years I've seen when looking on um, the help to buy first time flats and so on. So it's always worth looking into it because a leasehold is not a freehold. So if you're looking at a property and it says, 100 year lease. That means that you do own the flat that you buy, but you don't own the building or the land that it sits on. So it can be a little bit confusing because I've read a few things online of people that say live in London, they bought their lease a really long time ago. Well, they've inherited a lease, perhaps their parents, 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 parents. And now it's come to this sort of like 100 year lease that's come to an end and they are now being charged an extortionate amount to renew their lease, which means the freeholder has the right to say, if you don't give me X amount of money, it could be anything, 40 grand, 50 grand more, then I become the freeholder and the leaseholder. It all goes back to the freeholder and they just become a tenant, basically. So that's personally why I would never ever buy a leasehold property, um, because even though you might live in it and enjoy it and enjoy the ownership, of that property in later generations your family or wh whoever's living there will probably have to buy it again or like buy the lease again if that makes sense there's loads of stuff about this online and it's a bit worrying really i don't i don't really know why it exists in term well i do know why it exists it's so freeholders can make more money probably but i just find it a bit like sad i'm just so like, oh my gosh you could think that you own this property and then all these years later you've got to pay to renew the lease. Usually your solicitor or conveyancer as they're known in property world will give you all of the info you need to know about the leasehold of a property if you're about to buy one. So if you're gonna buy a property and it's only got 50 years left on the lease, any good solicitor will find that out when they do their searches and get all the information and just probably give you like the warning signs, like hang on a minute, in 50 years, you're gonna be needing to pay a lot of money again. And also you probably can't get a mortgage on a property if there's like less than 70 years left on the lease. So hopefully the red flags would be there for you if you were in that situation. But yeah, it's definitely worth doing a bit of research and doing a bit of digging because I just think it's alarming. Something that's also worth mentioning with the leasehold of a property is that, I think I mentioned it in the help to buy video series, you've got to contribute money towards a service charge, which is like a ground rent. It goes towards maintenance and upkeep of the building. 
and that could rise every year with inflation and by a certain percentage so it's just another thing to be wary of if you buy a leasehold because you'd be in for those extra charges as well the next one is a common hold which i hadn't heard of ever before i don't think you really see this as much but it's an alternative system to a leasehold and it's usually in estates of multiple occupancy so like big block of flats and it's where you own the freehold of the property but collectively you and all of the other freeholders of the said flats all collectively help manage and upkeep the the maintenance of the building so that's a common hold very different to a leasehold and different to a freehold because you're not the total owner you sort of share this common common hold with the other property owners of the other flats so there's probably more to this i'm going to do a bit more digging on that one as well because i haven't actually seen many that are doing this i think it's just a bit less common next one is mortgage so growing up all i knew about mortgages was that my mum and dad had to pay one um didn't really know anything more just that thing that they had to pay the mortgage but now I know that uh, the mortgage is the amount of money that you borrow to buy a property. So it's a loan from uh, usually a bank, a lender, and you pay that money back over time with interest. So that's basically a mortgage. Someone gives you money and you pay them back, but you pay them back a little bit more because you're like, thanks for giving me that money up front. That's the simplest way I could describe a mortgage. Also worth noting that if you don't pay your mortgage, the person who's lent you the money has what's called a charge against your property that you're buying. So if you don't pay it back, they could take the property that you're in and use that to sell it, to pay themselves back for the money they've lent you. That's not a nice situation to be in. I guess we'll talk about that in another video, perhaps when we go into things like negative equity, repossessions, and all of my learnings on that, because I feel like with the upcoming recession in the UK and probably globally, there's gonna be a lot of repossessions. There's gonna be a lot of people that can't pay their mortgages with everyone losing jobs. So it's definitely something to like get yourself clued up on like what is a repossession why is it happening why can't people pay their mortgages and like i said before i'm no expert i'm everything i'm talking about is information that i can find at my fingertips online information at my fingertips <laughs> anyway i don't know why that tickled me anyone can find this out it's just about just doing the reading and learning more about it before sort of signing on any dotted line and so on so what's a deposit so you might hear like deposit and mortgage going hand in hand so say for instance you were needing a hundred thousand pounds to buy a house and you had twenty five thousand pounds available to you and you were going to borrow a mortgage of seventy five thousand pounds the twenty five thousand pounds would be your deposit so this is like the initial money that you have ready to put down ready to commit which suggests you're going to go through with the property purchase and borrowing of the mortgage it's basically a set amount of money that secures your purchase loosely speaking the more deposit you put down the less your mortgage payments are going to be so all that means is if you borrow less money from the lender the bank then you're going to be having less to pay back usually you only need to borrow less when you've got more up front which is why people say oh i'm saving up for my deposit i'm trying to get a bigger deposit so they just don't have to borrow as much money from a bank or a lender it <clears throat> the next one is interest rates and this is simply a charge added to the amount that you pay back on a loan so for instance if i was lending you 100 pounds and i said i wanted a 10 percent interest rate that means that i'd be after 110,000 back 110,000 sorry I just meant 110 pounds I was thinking about a hundred grand mortgage but then I tried to simplify it by making it into a hundred pounds so I give you a hundred pounds I say 10% interest that means I get 110 back you're not going to be getting interest rates of 10% you might want to be looking at interest rates of around 4% just look at what mortgage lenders are offering right now speak to a mortgage advisor say what kind of interest rates would I be looking at right now and there's different types of um, mortgage repayments as well if you're in your own home you'll be paying a capital and interest mortgage but if you've got a buy to let you might be having an interest only mortgage on it for us with our buy to let property we're looking at 75 percent lending at a four to five percent interest only mortgage so just the way to work out interest rates are just to times 
So if it's 1%, it's 0.01. That's like 1% of something. And then you just times that by say 120,000 pounds. So that's 1,200. I hope that makes sense. This is just how you'd work out the percentage. It's a bit of a different calculation if you're working out capital and interest, but there's tons of calculators online that can help you figure out your mortgage payments. Even when you're on Rightmove, you can just scroll down and use the little mortgage calculator to figure out what kind of money you'd be paying back. And just to make it like crystal clear, you obviously have to pay back the whole amount plus the interest rate. You don't just pay the interest rate because that would mean that the money you got was free. So if you're borrowing £100,000 and you've got a 4% interest rate, then you'd be paying back the 100000 plus the 4% on top of the 100000 So in that case, you'd be paying back £104,000. And if you ever hear someone say cheap lending, then cheap lending is simply uh, low interest rates because Someone might say, oh, I've got some really cheap lending around 2%. That means that, if again, if it's the £100,000 example, you'd be paying 102000 back. So the cost of that money is only costing you, say, 2000 which is, like, really good. So the next one is an agreement in principle. It's simply a written estimate from a mortgage lender about how much money you could borrow on uh, the purchase of a property. And the reason why estate agents love a agreement in principle is because it means that you're not a time waster. So if you're able to go to your viewings and turn up and walk into their office and say, look, we've already got our agreement in principle. Here's our like letter from our mortgage provider saying, we could borrow £200,000 tomorrow if we found the place that we were looking for. So they, they absolutely love this because it means for them, it could be a speedy purchase. It can just go through really, really quickly and estate agents are used to people um, probably messing them around, going to view a house that they can't even afford to buy. If you've got an agreement in principle, then this shows already to the agent or to the vendor, if you're not dealing with an agent, that you're ready to go and you can act quickly. So how does a mortgage lender work out how much money they want to lend you? It's basically all based on your current income and your credit history, which is why I've said in previous videos that you shouldn't uh, lie to your mortgage broker or mortgage advisor, in-house broker, whoever you're talking to, about any credit card debts or anything that you've got against your name because it could just hinder your chances of, of getting an agreement in principle and also you just want to like be upfront and honest with these people because as soon as they run credit checks on you as well, they're probably going to find out. It's so worth doing a credit check as well. Like we're not just with one company, just do it with all of them. Do a free trial and then just like cancel it after the, the seven days is up. A lot of websites online let you do it for free. There's this really good website called Check My File. I think it was called Check My File. Just, I'll just check it now. Yeah, this one is so good. It's a multi-agency credit report. So the difference between this website and the other ones out there is that this one checks all of the credit providers so it checks Experian, Crediva, TransUnion, Equifax etc so it's checking all of them whereas you might get your credit score from only Experian and you might think you've got a fantastic credit score but then what might come up on this file is that Crediva have got some dirt on you from a mobile phone bill you didn't pay in 2007 and it's affected your credit score or something like that so all of the agencies have got different information about you so it's just worth checking them all because whoever's lending money to you will 100% be doing all the digging. You're like, I wanna know what tea they've got on me before they know it. Okay, here's one that I'm not really that familiar with because I haven't done this, but this is execution only. And this is when someone chooses a mortgage themselves. Rather than taking advice from a lender or from a uh, mortgage advisor, they just go for it themselves. So this is called execution only. I've not done it, but that's just worth knowing. Okay, the next one is loan to value, sometimes seen as L2V or LTV. I've seen it both of those ways. And I realize I mentioned it earlier in the video, but without doing this definition yet. So sorry about that. It just simply means the ratio of how much your loan will cover of the price of the property. So when I said 75% loan to value, that means I'm borrowing 75% worth of what the property is worth. So going back to the £100,000 example, if I had 25 saved and I needed a 75% loan to value, it means I'm getting 75 grand. So it's not always directly the number. I've just done it for that example to make it easier, if that makes sense. 
So I'll just do a, like a harder one using my calculator. So if we've got a property worth 250,000 pounds, but I needed to borrow 75% loan to value, I times it by 75%, which is uh, 0.75 on the calculator, and it's 187,500. So a 75% loan to value on a 250 grand house would be an 187,500 pound that you're borrowing from a lender. I hope that explains it. It's just how much of your mortgage will cover the price of the property. So they're always writing it as a percentage. It just helps everyone know how much. Oh, I've got a 75% mortgage or I've got a 90% mortgage. It means they're helping me buy 90% of this. I owe 90% of this. Next one is a bridging loan. So loads of people haven't heard of bridging before and it's probably for the best because it's quite expensive. Actually, I was looking at a bridging loan earlier this year for something we had our eyes on and bridging is expensive. But it's basically a short term temporary loan and it's to help a buyer purchase a property without them having that money up front. So it's usually in situations where somebody's in a chain and they're buying a property, but they're waiting for theirs to sell. Say theirs hasn't sold yet. They've borrowed this money short term. Say they're doing it on a six month bridge or an eight month bridge. That's how long they're borrowing it for. They'll purchase the new property, maybe outright or with a mortgage, or maybe they'll just bridge what they need for the deposit and they'll wait for their house to sell in order to pay off their bridge. Just to give you an idea of the percentage of, that bridging is charging, bridging fees can usually cost around one to 2% of the balance and exit fees are usually 1% of the loan if you pay it back early, but not all lenders charge this. So just say for example, I needed to borrow 150,000 pounds in cash outright to purchase a property because my house hadn't sold yet so let's say £150,000 at 2% bridging. That means the cost of borrowing that money for say six months is £3,000. It's gonna cost me three grand to borrow £150,000 in that example. Also, you've got costs to like set up the whole thing, which are called arrangement fees or broker fees. So that could be 500 quid or more or less. Every situation is different. So it's always worth just like talking to someone and then you've got uh, exit fees. So if you wanna come out of the bridge early, they'll charge you a fee for it because you said you were gonna borrow it for six months. If you're ready to pay it off after two months, there's an exit fee. So there's all sorts of stuff to look into, but sometimes people use it when they just need to get into a property and they know that theirs is gonna sell or investors use it because they aren't gonna be looking at like the cost of a shovel when they're like digging for gold because they know that this project they're working on is gonna be worth X amount, but the cost of the money, say the three grand, they need to borrow that money, it's all gonna be worth it in the end and they're gonna get more money back. So they'll make like a calculated risk in that sense. But in terms of like, your normal kind of homeowner that looks at bridging, it's usually because their house hasn't sold yet. So next one is equity. What does equity mean? I think I've said it in another video before, but equity or capital simply means the amount of money that a homeowner has put into a property. If we use the mortgage thing as an example, I've put down uh, 25,000 pounds into a house that cost 100,000. It means that I've got 25, thousand pounds equity in my house i still owe the rest of the seventy-five thousand to the bank that i'm paying off with a capital and interest mortgage and as i'm paying off that capital i'm adding more equity to my home so after a few years obviously i own more than the twenty-five thousand that i put in at the beginning it's just a way of homeowners knowing how much money they've got in those bricks do you know what i mean like okay how much have i got there and there and so on. I say it like there's just tons of houses sitting around everywhere. There isn't. Also, when you hear someone say that the house has gone up in value or they're gonna pull some equity out of their house, this is something that can just happen naturally, which I think I mentioned in my shared ownership video. You might buy a property and then after a few years, the property market goes up a bit and your house is now worth more than what you bought it for in some cases. It also, can also go down. But if it goes up, that means that just by living there in that property, you've like increased the amount of equity you've got in your home. Because when you bought it, it was worth 100 and now it's worth 120. So you've just got yourself some uh, free money if you wanted it. The next one is a surveyor. What's a surveyor? What do they do? So a surveyor in 
Property Terms is a qualified expert who specialises in examining and highlighting any potential issues or benefits of the property that could need fixing or might affect its price. A surveyor might come in and assess that there are some huge structural cracks in the wall that perhaps you didn't notice when you were walking around on your viewing. They might tell you that there's some potential like roof issue if you get them to look at the roof. There's all different sorts of levels of survey you can get as a home buyer. You can get a full on like structural survey about like the buildings, the foundations, or you could just get a home buyer survey, which is a little bit less intense. It's a bit more of an overview. It will sort of talk about things like just all sorts of stuff that you should really be aware of before buying a property. It can highlight a ton of things. You don't have to do this, but usually people advise that you do get a survey just because something could show up that you weren't aware of. You could find out that there's a coal mine underneath your house and that might affect your ability to get a mortgage. It might make the ground unstable. There's loads of things. And also your solicitor or your conveyancer conveyance it would probably be able to tell you that on the property searches which they do which is separate to getting a home buyer survey or a building survey also on a building survey sometimes also known as a um a full structural survey and this will report on to like the physical state of the property and this could go into so much detail it could even talk about trees that are nearby that could affect the foundations of the house. I mentioned earlier about the roof in getting a survey. I think having your roof checked is something more that would come under like a structural survey, but it's always just best to check because when you pay for a survey, they'll tell you the things that they're gonna be looking out for. And they might mention the things that they're not gonna be doing as well. And it's always helpful to know, you might book in for a survey that might not include anything to do with the foundations or potential like subsidence if it's not like immediately obvious to them. If you're buying a really old house, then it might be something worth looking into because you just want to know what you're buying and uh, what potential costs you could be in for to fix those problems. I mentioned it earlier again, but the next one is a chain. So I spoke about it before actually explaining what it was in a previous example. It's just basically when several property sales and purchases are sort of dependent on each other, interdependent. So for instance, you're selling your home, you're trying to buy this home, but you're waiting for this one to sell. So that requires a buyer from over here. So that you're in a little chain and people always say when houses fall through, like someone broke the chain or there's just like a chain reaction, isn't it? If someone doesn't sell their house, they haven't got the money to buy that house and so on. So people can't move on. But any sort of good estate agent can try and keep the chain moving and only work with people who are serious about a purchase. Going back to what I said earlier about having a decision in principle or an agreement in principle from a lender means that you're more likely to be able to move things along quickly and prevent any chains from breaking. An EPC, which you're gonna see all the time when you're scrolling for properties on say Rightmove or Zoopla, uh, it's an energy performance certificate. It shows the efficiency of a property and gives an indication of how much the energy bills will cost. There's two graphs that are displayed, uh, the energy efficiency and the environmental impact of the property. So each is graded from A being the best to G being the worst. And I currently live in an A grade EPC flat which is insane. So this is sort of known as an eco flat. And I'll put a graph on screen of the energy performance of the flat that I live in. It's extremely energy efficient. It's A grade because it was only built two years ago. So obviously it lives up to all of these new standards, extremely insulated. There's no heating to this property. There's no radiators. The only heating is like underneath. It's like underfloor heating throughout, which is never needed at all throughout the entire year because so bloody warm in here. I mean, that's an A-grade property. Anyway, you don't usually find these everywhere because not everywhere is new builds, but the kind of properties that we're looking at purchasing, we're trying not to really go any lower than a D. So the minimum level of efficiency uh, from April 2018, and this is from uh, a reliable source called landlordsguild.com, a new tenancy must have an EPC rating of at least E. E. Okay, this requirement also applies to all renewal tenancies to the same tenant. So this is to do with um, if you're gonna be renting a property off a landlord, if your energy efficiency rating is below E, 
for the property you're moving into, it is within your rights to challenge that landlord and say, you need to do something about the EPC rating of this flat and up your standards because we shouldn't really be living in this. It is a legal requirement to have a valid EPC when a building is sold, rented or constructed. If you don't have an EPC, or you don't see one, or there's none given to you when you're trying to buy a house, there could be a fine for the person trying to sell it. It's, you have to have it. You have to tell people what they're in for. And same goes for landlords, um, for people renting. You have to have an EPC available to you. If a property is under offer, it is still technically on the market. So under offer simply means that a offer has been accepted. So a seller has agreed a price with the buyer, but the contracts have not yet been exchanged. And as mentioned before in previous videos, at the moment of exchange, there is a legally binding agreement that you will be buying that property. So under offer, it doesn't really mean anything until it's gone through and been exchanged. This means if you really wanted to buy something, you could still call up and say, look, I wanna put my offer in. If anything falls through, please think of me. And then just keep chasing. If you've got your eyes on something, that's what we've been doing anyway. I've got like a big spreadsheet of properties and I just call up and chase. I'm currently chasing something that has been on the market for over a year and they just can't sell it and they're unwilling to accept what they're asking for, which is a stupid price, um, because it needs so much work doing to it. Hopefully, hopefully that will be the next one after the one where we're currently on. But yeah, under offer doesn't really mean anything, just means they've accepted the offer. Gazumping, which I actually haven't heard any estate agent say, but I've found it here. It's when a higher offer is made by another party and it's accepted. So sometimes after the offer with the first buyer has been accepted, someone will uh, gazump that offer and make a higher offer. I, w I wonder if this comes into play at auctions where someone can like just jump in with a higher offer at the last minute or maybe that has a uh, another term we'll soon find out and then the opposite of that is gazundering gazundering <laughs> sounds funny so it's when a buyer lowers their price usually at the last minute so that the seller has to accept them or else they risk having to find another buyer so if someone's really motivated to sell and they're in a position where they just want to get it done and then your offer is accepted and then at the last minute you do a little bit of a not very nice thing and you just sort of lower your offer for whatever reason it could be for a valid reason maybe you realize that the house isn't worth that much because you've had a survey done and evaluation has said actually you're overpaying for this it's only worth this you go in with a lower offer they have to accept you because they don't want to go through the hassle of finding another buyer that one is gazondering i hope i'm saying that right gazundering gazundering <laughs> i've never heard it but i found it here and there are people that do use these words so it's worth saying exchange of contracts is both when the seller and the buyer have committed to the transaction before this the buyer or the seller can walk away at any point before the contracts have been exchanged and not really incur many or any fees depending on how far they've got with the solicitor they might just be paying a few solicitors fees that's basically what happened with us with the first property everything but the exchange had happened because obviously it was going through probate so we only lost a bit of money with solicitors but if eventually that property does go through the probate process then we would get that money back because we'd go ahead with the same solicitor that we were using and that would just come off the final fee of her work. A conveyancer, which is also known as a solicitor, is just one that specialises in transferring of home ownership. So if you're using a mortgage, they'll cover every legal aspect of the home purchasing process. You might see a solicitor sign off their email as conveyancer. It's just basically a specialist solicitor. Title is the legal right of owning a property or land. So this also is heard with the the term deeds. Deeds are simply documents that shows you who owns the title of a property or land. It's worth noting as well that the deeds can show any obligations or responsibilities on the property. So for example, things you can't alter, any access and rights of way on the property. And these are usually held by the mortgage lender until you pay off your property. So the next one is land registry. I believe there are separate registries for uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. The 
land registry here in England and Wales is the government's database of who owns what property and land. On the government land registry website, you could type in the postcode of a property and the door number. And for three pounds, you can download the information of who is the legal owner of that property, whether it's owned by an individual, whether it's owned by a company, all of this information is in the public domain. So if you pay three pounds, you can get the title uh, deeds. And if you pay another three pounds, you can get access to like the deeds which show you the plot, like the exact plot with the red lining. I'll show you an example. I'm not gonna show you any that I've downloaded because they're personal, but here's the example one from the website. This is what the document looks like. This is the name of the person who owns it. It will say the year that they purchased it in, how much they purchased it for, whether there's any charges against the property. A charge is something that the lender would have on the property. So they might have first charge on a property. If you've uh, borrowed a lot of money from them, you haven't paid your house off yet, they have the right to take that house off of you if you don't pay. So that's like a charge on a property, which you'll see that on the deeds. Moving on, a new build simply means a property that hasn't been purchased or lived in yet and has been recently built. I think in my shared ownership video, I said that a new build had to be built in the last two years. I think that still stands, but it's always worth asking when you're looking around a property that you think is a new build when it was built and just double check that it's technically a new build. It says here um, that different banks and lenders have different definitions of what is a new build. So it can vary from whether the property has been lived in but not bought, whether it's been converted and refurbished or whether it's been finished within a certain amount of years. Completion date is the next one. So this is the date that the transaction is complete between the buyer and the seller. It's usually also the day that the estate agent will release the keys to the property and if you're the buyer then you'll get access to your property for the first time which is quite exciting. It's worth noting that exchange and completion is not always on the same day. You might exchange on a property but you not, might not complete for another 10, 12, 20 days, however long you want really. You're in control of that if you're the buyer. I'm so sorry, there's some really loud seagulls outside. I'll just wait for them to leave. So we're trying to film a video here. I don't know what they're doing. Snagging is the next one and you might hear this in terms of like new builds or refurbs. It's like the finishing touches on the property, touching up a little bit of paintwork, adjusting appliances or fixing any little minor faults within the property. And also a snagging survey is usually completed prior to the buyer moving in. You can spot like minor cosmetic issues with it and check the quality of workmanship, especially if you're buying a new build. There's always snagging to be done. Friends of ours that have just moved in to a new build in the Midlands had a few snagging issues. Actually ended up getting dealt with once completion was done and they'd moved in. So this can be like before or after, but it's better to just do it before because you're still like, you know, you haven't been handed the keys and it's like, yeah, up to you now. So yeah, usually people will be quite flexible with you, but you might not get a housing provider that's very generous. So um, yeah, it's always worth getting your snagging done before you move in. So the next one is stamp duty. And it's really important to talk about this one because there's been some big changes here with stamp duty, which means that a lot of people are buying houses right now. And we've got this mini boom because everyone's so excited about saving on stamp duty. So I'll just go through what the new rules are. Anyone buying a house costing up to £500,000 between the 8th of July 2020 and the 31st of March 2021 will not pay any stamp duty. So it's quite a big deal. And more expensive properties will only be taxed on their value above that amount. It could save buyers as much as £15,000 if they're buying a property for £500,000 or more. So if you're buying a property from zero to 500,000 pounds, your stamp duty rate will be zero between the dates that I said. And then above that, it goes into different percentages of stamp duty, which I will screenshot and put on the video here. There's a website here called moneyadviceservice.org.uk and it's got a stamp duty calculator. So you can just put in the price of a property and it will tell you how much stamp duty you'd be due to pay. So if I put 125,000 pounds in, just say, and I am buying my next home or buying an additional property or second home, depends, 
because buy to let stamp duty is different to residential. It works out the percentage for you. So it says mine would be zero, which is great. That's all you need to know about stamp duty. There is this mini boom at the moment in the UK. A lot of people are saying that it's going to be over soon because of all of the furloughed people and a lot of unemployment that's coming. I, I, I'm just saying what I've heard, by the way, I'm not a professional. But yeah, it's just worth doing a little bit of reading about it because so many people think they're getting a bargain right now. So they're buying without stamp duty. But as a result of this, properties in London, for example, are just ramping up their prices and just getting more money because people think they're getting this saving with no stamp duty they've just put the price of the property up so what you would have paid on stamp duty the seller's just going to get that money now so you can't win can you really well you can you can win you can win let's stay positive we've come to the end of my list thank you so much for watching if you want a part two please let me know because i've got more but i just realized that this video is so so long and i don't want to bore anyone to death if you've watched all the way to the end then thank you so much property is such a boring subject and i just think that there's room to make it a little bit more fun i don't know if i injected any fun into that video but i'd like to think that i did so please leave me a comment like i'm open to all your feedback let me know down below don't forget to subscribe to this channel and follow for more property videos including my property journey with my partner we're also on instagram at property couple uk and yeah there's loads of other places you can find me on the internet as well i always have a personal channel just constantly online guys i will see you in the next video thanks so much for watching bye